You've been traveling along the high road for days. As evening approaches, you spot a wooden signpost next to a trail that leads north into the hills. Nailed to the post are three arrow-shaped signs. The two marked Waterdeep and Daggerford follow the high road to point in opposite directions. The third, marked Nightstone, beckons you to follow the trail. Hello everyone, I'm Alex, and today we are going to discuss the possible adventure hooks to Storm King's Thunder, running each milestone in Chapter 1, and what I learned from running the intro to this epic adventure. A great upheaval is exactly that. It's an uphill climb for both players and DMs from start to finish. Let's dive right in. If you are starting Storm King's Thunder with brand new characters, the hooks provided at the beginning of the chapter suggest that the players have already made the decision to go to Nightstone when the adventure begins, and honestly, they leave a bit to be desired. A common theme of the first chapter, I suggest creating your own hook. What I did is I had the characters be from Daggerford, and some of them were even members of the City Watch. Lady Morin Daggerford contacts the individuals and forms them into a team with the purpose of investigating Nightstone. She's heard reports of disturbances by elves, orcs, goblins, and even giants. She declares it must be nonsense and must know the truth. You could easily do something similar or use the even larger city of Waterdeep as a starting location and have the hook be anything. It can also help if one of the players start in a faction as they can be tasked with the investigation from that organization. This chapter is designed to advance a party of first level characters to fifth level. The characters gain levels by accomplishing various goals. In the next part of the video, I'm going to dive into each of the milestones and discuss my experiences and ideas for each of them. There are a lot of crafty and equally foolish goblins in the village of Nightstone when the players arrive. Review the names and personalities of each goblin before running this encounter. The goblins all have their own goals and interests. Some of them value their lives and the lives of their companions dearly, and they should react accordingly. The goblins should not be perceived as downright evil, because that would make it more difficult to have the players possibly ally with them later in the chapter. They should have conversations with each other as the characters approach and call each other by name to deepen the lore that all monsters aren't faceless minions. The most likely thing that the players are going to do when they enter the town is investigate the ringing bell. When the players enter the village, they should see the two wargs feasting on the corpse of the dog and know immediately something is afoot. Unless the players make an active attempt to avoid alerting the wargs to their presence, when the players approach the door to the temple, they attack. If the players silence the bell before confronting the wargs, they will likely become overwhelmed by the amount of goblins that respond to the combat in the square. So this is advantageous for both you and your party, even if they don't realize. At the very least, have your party make stealth checks against the wargs' passive perception to see if they slip past them unnoticed, with advantage if the bell is still ringing. After dealing with the bell, the players will probably go to the inn or the keep, the two largest buildings in town, while clearing different buildings and groups of goblins along the way. In the inn, the players should run into Kella Dark Hope, which is great because you can finally tell the players what is going on. Kella may be allied with the Jintarum, but she knows quite a bit of information that the players need. Be sure that she doesn't come off as too suspicious. If a player chooses to question the validity of her story, then roll the check to find out the truth. Don't forget about her flying snake pet, which she will certainly try to hide behind her back at first, which should tip the players off that she isn't all what she seems. When the players finally decide to head to the keep, they will learn the fate of Lady Velrosa Nandar, the ruler of this humble village, and meet their first real allies, the four guards inside. The guards should be arguing loudly over who is at fault for the death of the lady and have no knowledge of the goblin invasion. The guards can fill in any of the missing details that the players did not learn from Kella or learn everything from them if they came here first. Once the players get on good terms with the guards, they should assist them with defeating the remaining goblins. Add some planks to the inside of the castle. The guards lay across the broken gap of the bridge, with the player's help, of course. I recommend foregoing the book's advice and having the players long rest after ridding the village of goblins. 
the setting sun can be enough to encourage your players to do so. If the players are smart enough to close the drawbridge in the evening, they are rewarded in the morning with the Gentarum at the gate. Otherwise, the gents have already made their way into the village when the players have awakened. Depending on if Kella was discovered, she may be with the players or still hiding in the inn and act accordingly. She may have also decided to slip away during the night. If she rolls stealth higher than anyone's passive perception, she slips away unnoticed, possibly lowering the drawbridge anyway. The guards should also be present if they are still alive and provide support if needed. Continue with the gent encounter as written until conflict arises. If it appears combat is going to erupt, or if the gents have been dismissed and are about to leave, have the orc party show up and force the two groups to work together. Don't forget about the orcs' extra movement as they attempt to get into the village. If the drawbridge is raised in time, have the orcs split into two groups, one led by the chief and the other by the shaman, until one finds the hole which they can climb into the village with. Have regular orcs threaten ranged characters by throwing their javelins into the towers. The towers should provide at least half cover, although the book does not mention anything of the sort. As soon as the orcs break into the village, drawbridge or not, have the elves immediately swoop in and cause them to flee a couple rounds later. The elves can use their nimble form and acrobatics to scale the walls with the help of some rope and a well-placed arrow so they should be able to enter the conflict quickly. The idea is to wrap this one up as soon as it starts to get deadly, as the entire event can leave your party exhausted. After the event, continue with the Gentarm encounter as normal if they happen to still be around and did not flee. After a short rest level up, the players should be ready to tackle the Dripping Caves. The guards and the Seven Snakes refuse to accompany the adventurers. If the players are keen on long resting, the guards remind them that the villagers have been missing for over a day and they may not have the luxury to rest another night. How the characters enter the Dripping Caves changes a lot about how the encounter goes. If the characters blindly approach the main entrance, inform the characters with dark vision that they see the ogre bathing in mud not too far into the cave. If the players don't have any light sources, they shouldn't be noticed as long as they don't loiter and make too much noise. Hopefully, they decide to look for another way in. Perhaps even suggest this idea, as new players may not realize that it is an option. If the players loop around to Area 3A, they will likely have a deadly encounter with the Black Pudding, which they will hopefully either ignore or flee from. Try to overplay the intensity of the monster, as to clue the players in that it might be best avoided. You should funnel the players to either Area 6 or Area 7, so they can encounter Snigbat or Boss Hark right off the bat. If the players are clever enough to check the top of the hill, they are rewarded with Snigbat as an ally, and once Boss Hark is defeated, the remaining goblins will assist the players in defeating the ogres. If they enter from Area 6, they will have to deal with Boss Hark's demands, or face the goblins in full force. Either way, the encounter should be intense, and the Battle of the Dripping Caves is the climax of the chapter, and a chance for your party to taste true victory for the first time. For the cave in Area 5, I put a Basilisk's Lair. The goblins would be familiar with this creature, and even offer the party a reward of the treasure they have for slaying it. It could also be an alternate to the black pudding if you think it would suit your party better. The basilisk should have a few crumpled up petrified goblins outside of its lair, which is full of columns and piles of rocks for it to hide behind. It attempts to surprise the party and catches many adventures in its gaze before attacking. It has a small hoard containing one or two magic items from table A or B, along with no more than 150 GP worth of treasure. If the players long rest to level 4 and then double back to the cave before completing chapter 1 to face the horror, or return later in chapter 3 at level 6 or 7, adjust the encounter accordingly, with two basilisks, or even a hydra lair. The book has descriptions of the villagers trapped in the caves, and it even says that every few hours a villager is brutally eaten. Next on the menu is the late Lady Velrosa Nandar's Lady-in-Waiting, Lady Daphne Featherstone. The book doesn't specify, but Lady Featherstone should also be a lesser noble and would be next in line to be the ruler of the village of Nightstone. If the players delay after arriving at the Dripping Cave for any reason, or decide to long rest after the encounter with the gents, orcs, and elves, 
she would most certainly have been eaten already. Without the lady, the fate of Nightstone may change. Perhaps the seven snakes return, and without proper resistance, they can easily take the town. However, if the lady survives, she could contact the nearby town of Daggerford, or the city of Waterdeep, which are both members of the Lord's Alliance, and would send a team to reinforce the village and spread their influence. But the consequences could be anything. Maybe the Cloud Giants return. But before any of these consequences happen, the players are set on a quest by one of the surviving villagers. Most likely Morak Urgray. Let's face it, the quests that he gives the party are flat out awful. Go tell someone that someone else is dead, one of which locations is over 500 miles away. I would recommend coming up with literally any other reason to send the players to the chosen town. If Lady Featherstone is still alive, perhaps she has a relative in one of these towns and she needs them to come to Nightstone and be an advisor or heir. Bonus points if the adventurers end up escorting this character back to Nightstone, for payment of course, and see possible consequences to their actions. They could even face any creatures in the Driven Caves remaining that have been terrorizing the goblins and villagers alike. Zephyros is the first friendly giant that the players encounter, and this is critical as the players need to realize that not all giants are foes. Be sure to play up his eccentric personality. He also possesses very important information about the Ordning. Ideally, he should explain everything in the Ordning section at the beginning of the book during the journey to the destination town. One thing the book doesn't mention is how the players are meant to get to the upper floor of the tower. During encounters, Zephyros can materialize cloud stairs that lead from the bottom floor to the second. If you prefer, you could also offer the griffins to the party as mounts during the encounters. However, later in the book, it implies the characters need to be taught how to fly griffins, so the griffins could carry them in their talons instead. The first possible encounter is with the air cultists. This encounter feels out of place and doesn't really contribute to the story in any meaningful way, in my opinion. If your players have never run Princes of the Apocalypse and never plan to, I would just bypass this encounter entirely. You can have Zephyros give the players any of the items they would have received from the cultist encounter, if you prefer. The Lord's Alliance Strike Team is an interesting one. I recommend running this encounter as it can show your players the narrow-minded tactics of the Lord's Alliance. After the dwarves get dropped off at the base of the tower by the dragon, they should huddle up and the leader should give a short speech to remind the troops why they are there and the mission, giving the players an opportunity to eavesdrop. Ideally, the players should convince the Lord's Alliance team to back down. If Zephyros is not knocked out by the breath attack, he can easily use mass suggestion to get everyone to leave as the book states as well. Finally, I highly recommend having Imrith make a surprise appearance towards the end of the journey. Zephyros' continued scrying and contacting planar entities for information has alerted Imrith of his wandering eyes. She must hinder him without causing too much attention before he uncovers the truth. I would add Control Weather to her spell list and have her create a massive thunderstorm around the tower, which causes Zephyros to become blind to anything in the storm. Zephyros claims he has everything under control as the tower begins to shake and the storm grows outside. Suddenly, Imrith lands on the cloud, causing the entire tower to become off balance. Have everyone inside make a dex save DC 15 or fall prone in roll initiative. She then claws her way up the side of the tower, stoking fear into the hearts of the party. As she climbs, she casts Stone Shape on the side of the tower to create two or three gargoyles for the party to fight. If anyone attempts to leave the tower, the storm causes the area to become heavily obscured. If the players press on to find out what is scaling the tower, have Emirith use her legendary actions to swat them with her tail and propel them back inside. When she gets to the top, she casts Stone Shape again to create a hole in the tower when she finally reveals herself. She reels her head back and lightning breaths the navigation orb, dooming the tower. Then she flees, leaving behind any gargoyles that fight until destroyed. You could even have the tower make a crash landing, rather than just becoming completely stationary as the book implies. This attack gives Zephros a reason to stop meddling in these affairs and scares him straight, so to speak. 
rather than him just deciding or being told by extraplanar entities that his role in the adventure is done. Obviously, for this encounter, Emrith casts Stone Shape multiple times, which I do not think breaks her stat block in any meaningful way. If you need to limit the ability for yourself, then limit it to three times per day. Ensure Zephros survives the encounter. Additionally, he would know nothing about Emrith other than the fact that she is an ancient blue dragon. He would also state plainly that scrying into matters beyond his understanding has led him to nothing but trouble, before bidding the adventurers farewell. If the players ever return to the crash site, Zephros and the tower are long gone. Also, if you prefer, you can have Emrith show up when the Lord's Alliance does, rather than running a separate encounter. Well, that's the video. Thanks for watching. If you're wondering which town in Chapter 2 you should choose, then check back for my Storm King's Thunder video going over Bryn Shander, Golden Fields, and Tribor, and how to get the most out of the content from each location. 